From this point onward, we will be discussing metabolic processes related to human biochemistry, and this will serve as an introduction for all of the succeeding metabolic discussions. So, first things first, the definition of metabolism in many references is the sum of all chemical reactions in the living organism. By living organism, it could refer to either unicellular organisms like prokaryotes or multicellular ones like us humans. And by the meaning of sum, we can think of the word metabolism as all of the tens of thousands of different chemical reactions going inside our body. For all we know, the moment I'm speaking right now, you're listening to it, there must have been already several billion of trillions of unique chemical reactions being done by your many billions of different cells and your many different tissues. And therefore it's daunting, it's scary how many those are. So of course, if we are to truly understand the important parts of metabolism, we should have a way to group several chemical reactions from that sum, right? And indeed we have. We could group several important and related steps in our uh, body as what we call metabolic pathways. And maybe for an, a working analogy, we could think of the sum as an entire map of a town or a city. And then probably a metabolic pathway is a significant part of that map. Maybe a major road, a certain avenue, a certain landmark, Okay, the capital of a certain city or a certain, a certain region, and so on and so forth, wherein we know that a metabolic pathway is significant because of two major requirements. A pathway should have a goal, and a pathway should have a direction towards reaching that goal. And just to have a working example, let us use this to understand these two requirements. Do take note that a metabolic pathway has no fixed number of steps. In this case, I have three steps, but the pathway could have two, it could have four, it could have five, it could have 10, as long as it has a goal in the direction. For example, let us assume that our starting point is molecule A, and then it could undergo step one to become B, B could undergo step two to become C, and C could undergo step three to become D, which we want to think of here as the goal. It's our kind of promised land. We want to get here, the end product. So that's the goal. I have just stated that. But how about the direction? How do we assure that we're going to get here or at least um, force ourselves to get close to this? The answer to that lies in the arrows of the steps. Step one and three are reversible. They are, as you could see, uh, going in both directions. So step one means A could become B, but B could also become go back to A. Three shows that C could become D or D could become C. But very important is this step because after step two, B becomes C and the uh, opposite step or the opposite direction is not allowed. That means the moment that this step takes place, it's either we are stuck with molecule C if it doesn't want to go anywhere or it will become the one we want, which is letter D. So as you can see here, the irreversible step is actually an assurance that we are actually going to the direction that we want, which is the direction towards our goal. Because if you think of it like this, what if even this step is reversible? What would be the problem? The problem is you have the risk of not getting to where you are. For example, if all of the steps here were reversible, that means A could become B, B could become C, C could become D, but then you, th you think you are already here and you're like happily ever after? No, because if all steps were reversible, it means you still have the probability of D going back all the way to A. And it's like you're going here and then you're going back, back and forth, and like you're not going anywhere. A pathway, a hypothetical pathway that is like this is called a futile pathway. And it's futile because it's not even going anywhere. It is directionless. It doesn't have a point. Thus, in order to avoid having a futile pathway, there must be at least one irreversible step. There could be two, there could be three, but at least one. Now, other than the goal and the direction, it should also be noted that we pay special attention to the 
change in the complexity of the molecule before and after the pathway. Some pathways start with large complex molecules and then they end up with smaller molecules. Such are called catabolic pathways. Some uh, times we have small molecules being uh, uh, assembled together to build up larger molecules. Such are called anabolic pathways. It was also known that if I have large molecules, like for example, this is a polymer, I have the, these uh, circles being connected to one another. And then by a catabolic process, we could imagine them being cut off into individual pieces. Or maybe we can think of anabolism as these individual pieces being connected together such that they become a large molecule. Other than the change in the size, it should be also noted that there's also a corresponding change in the energy. That is, usually catabolic processes produce energy. They generate, they make energy from the process, but the energy is used up in anabolic processes. But why is that? Uh, and I would like to pay special attention to the catabolic process. Why is it? That when you when you break down large molecules into smaller ones, you produce energy. Where did that even come from? And just to remind you, every time you have a bond and then you break it, that actually releases some kind of energy. Oftentimes we actually call that as the delta H or the enthalpy. And maybe uh, let me reserve that for the end of my discussion here. Um, uh, I will em emphasize why that is significant. Now, before uh, again getting to this point, I would just like to mention that in, uh, since we are already talking about energy, we also have to ask the question, how do we refer to energy when we talk about metabolic pathways? Do we use the same way? Uh, do we use the same uh, unit in physics like joules or kilojoules? And the answer to that is no. Instead of using the traditional units, we instead uh, use biomolecules to uh, uh, correspond to our so-called energy currency. So instead of counting the joules, we count these molecules. The most prominent of all, of course, is ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Since adenosine is not the only nucleotide available, there are also other options, primarily guanosine triphosphate. Others, I think, are also possible, but they are not going to be mentioned as far as my next recordings are concerned. But it should be known that since ATP and GTP are basically equals, they are both nucleoside triphosphates, uh, it should be noted that one GTP is equal to one ATP, one is to one. Now, if you don't want to use triphosphates, we could actually see energy in the form of cofactors like NADH and FADH. NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Do remember that this comes from nicotinic acid, which is actually from B3. B3 is niacin or nicotinic acid. FAD stands for flavine adenine dinucleotide. Flavine coming from riboflavin or vitamin B2. Now, it's also proper to call NADH as reduced NAD and FADH as reduced FAD. And why? Just as I recall, remember in organic chemistry, the addition of hydrogen actually counts as reduction, right? So if NAD becomes NADH, I added hydrogen. So we could say that this is the reduced form of NAD, like so. And the same applies with FAD. So if FAD gets a hydrogen, it becomes FADH or FADH2, although, in, uh, although most references write it as Fad H2, I will just read it as Fad H. Okay, uh, the same applies. Reduction has happened. So Fad H is reduced form of Fad. Or in the other case, we could also say that the opposite process is oxidation. So that's why we could say that the NAD or the Fad without the H can be referred to as the oxidized cofactors. And that is important because the reduced forms can be equated to a specific amount of ATP. A single NADH or a single reduced NAD could be converted to 2.5 molecules of ATP, and a single FADH could be converted to 1.5 molecule of ATP. But they are not exactly like ATP. Uh, anyway, since we're using the currency analogy, 
think of ATP as hard cash, like coins or bills. You can think of mad age or fad age as probably bank checks, where you know that if you want a check to be converted to actual money, you have to go to a bank and then have it processed. The thing is, mad age and fad age are not ATP, and they still need to go through a certain bank, or in this case, a certain metabolic pathway, so that you could convert them to ATP. And that process is actually called the electron transport chain, which is, of course, reserved for future discussion. Now, let's go to that very important question. Why? As in, why do we even need to perform metabolism? Is it just possible that I could survive or exist without having any chemical reaction in my body? And the answer actually is no. Why is that? Um, in order to uh, avoid getting too philosophical or even too, uh, too thermodynamic about it, let me just uh, state this in the simplest way I can. Basically, all things are bound to reach equilibrium with the universe or with the, the surroundings. That also applies to us living creatures. In other words, at one point, we're going to be one with the environment. That's just a fancy way for saying we're going to die and we're going to decay and our, our, our body parts will decompose and they will be one with the universe. So why is that not happening at the moment right now that we are living and breathing? That is because we are trying to fight this equilibrium. Particularly, we're trying to fight something called entropy, which is the rate of disorder. In classic thermodynamics, it is well known that the rate of disorder or entropy is constantly increasing in the universe. In us, that means that our body systems will also be disorderly and we will die. And again, we will disperse to the environment the moment we die. But why is it that we survive and not die? That is because we have free energy to fight off entropy, particularly coming from the delta H produced by us breaking down the large molecules. And where are these coming from? The food that we eat. So essentially, if we're going to uh, think of eating as, a, as something more complicated and probably more philosophical, it's like we eat because the bonds that we break from the food we eat and probably from, from the other complicated molecules we can break down inside our own body are converted to a certain amount of delta H, which is hopefully greater than the rate of disorder around us. So if I have more H than S, there is a little bit of change which we could use in order to survive. That's why we often call delta G as the free energy. Because even after accounting for the disorder around us, there is still a little bit from the food that we eat that we could use to uh, 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 power the things that our body is doing. And because of that, we don't become one with the environment or in other words, die immediately. In other words, with all that I said, we need to perform metabolism because we need to stay alive. That's it. And so in my next discussions, I will be discussing the way that we produce that energy we need to survive. That is cell respiration. And just to state the most commonly uh, cited uh, reaction for cell respiration, we say that glucose can react with oxygen in order to yield carbon dioxide, and water and energy in the form of ATP.